Hey, everybody, it's Greg again, and it's another edition of Unbreakable, the podcast. Uh, it is Saturday, May the 18th. Not a big show today. Uh, we're going to do our TV classic of the week. You're going to love this show. I love this show. And uh, just wanted to tell you, you know, today we have our annual Dogwood Parade here in town. And it's a, it's, I think it's a nice tradition. Uh, it's been going on since the 50s, since, since I was just a spark in my parents' eyes. It just, uh, it's, it celebrates the Dogwood Festival. We have a lot of dogwood trees around town and in the park. And it's just, uh, it's held every third Saturday in May. And usually the weather sucks because usually the, the third week in May is always cool and rainy and damned if it isn't. It is. Um, I know because I used to take this week off almost every year when I was a social worker. Why? I don't know. Just because I, you know, right before Memorial Day, it's nice to take the break, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You watch next week here in Pennsylvania, it'll be beautiful, which it's supposed to be, sunny and warm. And that's the way it's always been since I was a kid. This week really sucks. The next week is beautiful. Anyway, this Dogwood Festival thing, I got to tell you a little bit about it. It's a whole week thing. They have a fair in the park, uh, rides for the kids, goldfish, uh, <laughs> uh, games, you know, stuff to eat, like uh, funnel cake, popcorn, all that, all that junk food, yeah. But good. And you get, it's like a, a, a community thing where people, neighbors meet each other, people you don't see for months and months. Uh, you see in the walking in the park and, uh, it's really a hometown traditional thing. There's a dogwood queen who is crowned every in April and, uh, has a court at their high school, high school girls. And, uh, they ride on a float in the parade and the parade is usually a, Marching bands, although there were a lot more march, local marching bands when I was a kid. Um, from all over the coast, from Downingtown, Potsdam, they would all come in with their high school junior high bands. And uh, uh, fire engines are wailing with their sirens, police cars with their lights, and uh, calliopes, do, 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 do. you know, that sort of thing. Jugglers, and uh, just all kinds of groups, you know. It's very, very, very small townish, but it's good. It's tradition, you know? And we need that. We we need that. That sort of brings it back to reality, you know? Uh, after everything that's going on in the world now, all the fast paced, you know, the, the phones and the internet, the blah, blah, blah. When you go to something like the Dogwood Cream every third Saturday, in May, which is Armed Forces Day, by the way, thank you for serving. If you've been in, in if you're in the uh, service or have been, um, so what's really neat about it is that it just kind of brings back to earth, it grounds you, you know, uh, going like all time. You you could sit on a, a, a sidewalk in a lawn chair as the parade winds down Main Street, and uh, your grandchildren are there, and your children are. There. And uh, you look across the street and there are people you haven't seen in a long time, you know? And it's just a tradition that passes on and on and on through the generations. And it's kind of cool. So I just wanted to share that with you. That it's Dogwood Festival Parade Day. Yay! And, it, you know, they have a, a entertainment in the park after the parade. The local bands play. Uh my brother, who had a, had a rock band when I was growing up, he, he played there with his band one time. And, you know, the celebrities, local celebrities. We had Sally Star there. The people who are local, you know Sally Star. She was like this cowgirlish uh, lady with the outfit on. And uh, she, would, she would be the hostess of Popeye's Cartoon Theater every Saturday morning. And I just love it. I get up early, watch Popeye, and watch all the cartoons. And she was the host. 
And then they had the chief half town, who at the time they were called Indians. Now it's Native Americans, uh, who hosted a local sh kids show. Captain Noah was there, was at the parade one time. And uh, we had this guy who was a Green Beret. His name was Lieutenant uh, Major or whatever. Barry Sand Sandra. He had a big song out about 66, 67, The Ballad of the Green Berets. If you've never heard it before, uh, ask your uh, robot to play it, you know? It, uh, and he actually came to our parade and sang the song in our in Reeves Park, in our park, uh, after the parade. So that was kind of cool. So you would get to see these local celebrities in the flesh as they, you know, rode down the street in these open the cars, you know, uh, convertible cars, and, and, and the local, uh, the mayor, and blah, 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 all that stuff. But, uh, and they would throw candy out at you, throwing candy at it. People would uh, scarf up the candy in the road, you know, and uh, bite each other, you know, for it. But it was, it was uh, always a good time. And a lot of fond, fond memories from Dogwood Day. All right. Well, today is our classic TV show. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a couple months now, and it's really a lot of fun to do. And it seems like uh, people like to watch it and listen to it because it seems like uh, I get a lot, lot more viewers. So, oh, before I go, how can I forget? Uh, this program is dedicated, of course, to uh, the patron saint. Of the Unbreakable Podcast, Bud Bud. There he is, our friend Bud Bud. Look at the tongue man himself. Huh? What a cutie he is. He is missed, but he is always in our hearts. All right, I'm going to do the theme song like I usually do. This one has no words to it that I know of. So I'm going to do the melody. You'll know what it is right away. You ready? Here we go. That's all it is. Yes, it's the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone is our classic TV show of the week. Now, I got to tell you, I love the Twilight Zone. I still watch the Twilight Zone. You know, they have it on marathons now. The Twilight Zone may be even more popular now than what it was when it was first aired. Uh, between 1959 and 1964. Now, we're just going to talk about the original series, Twilight Zone. So it, it was brought back again in the 80s. Uh, and then there were Twilight Zone so movies, you know. And then uh, there was a spinoff called Night Gallery. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the main series, which lasted five years on CBS, okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Twilight Zone so then we're going to talk about Rod Serling, the brilliant, brilliant creator, producer, writer, host of The Twilight Zone. And finally, what some of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes are, and maybe they're your favorites too. We'll see. So, Twilight Zone. Oh my God, what a show. Uh, and what I loved about it was the macabre, this is the way it's described, the macabre twist at the end. I love those little unexpected twists at the end. And it, there was always a little moral to the story, you know, uh, at the uh, end. It was sci-fi. It was fantasy. It was horror. Uh, it was uh, all, these, all these genres blended, you know. Uh, my favorites, as you'll hear in the, in the uh, my favorite episodes, was the time travel, you know. Uh, but they were just uh, so good. Yeah, there were a few episodes that were clunkers. I I did, but most of them were really cool. And and they uh, even though some of the episodes are are dated, you know, because again they were filmed in the late fifties, early sixties. Uh, the premise of the story uh, is never dated, never dated. So uh, it, it's just a cool show. I just love it. Uh, it was on for five seasons on CBS, and uh, TV Guide uh, named it out of the 60, now get this, out of the 60 greatest shows 
in television history. TV Guide named it the fifth greatest show of all time. That's how that's how great this show is. You've seen the Twilight Zone I, on marathons. You know, they play it like Twilight Zone marathons on either the Sci-Fi Channel or lately they've been moving you know, around to other channels. So what you have to do, uh, it, it may be on uh, for Memorial Day weekend this weekend. Uh, they play it on 4th of July, about 4th of July, and Labor Day. And a lot of times over New Year's, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Um, so if it's not on sci-fi, you just, just Google it and you'll find the channel it's on. But it's just a string of uh, episodes for like two days straight, uh, 24 hours a day, all episodes of Twilight Zone. And most of them are 30 minute episodes. For season four, they did go to one hour, one hour uh, like episodes, but they weren't as good. You know, they weren't as good. And so they, they just dropped that. And for the final season, they went back to a half an hour. Um, and TV Guide also named the Twilight Zone out of the 60 greatest dramas in television history. The Twilight Zone was number four. Like I said, it's just such, such a great, great show. Um, you know, the original Twilight Zone episode, the pilot, never showed. It was supposed to be, it was a pilot called Concept. And it was a dream about this guy who had a dream of uh, being in Honolulu right before the attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, he just had this reoccurring dream over and over and over. He couldn't get out of it. A lot of the Twilight Zone episodes have to do with dreams. Things like that. I remember the one episode. It did make my top ten, but I loved it, though. It was about uh, this lady. Uh, this, uh, it was like this fantasy thing where the sun the sun was hurling toward the earth. And nobody could stop it. And eventually the sun was going to crash into the earth. And the earth was going to explode and die. And all the people in the land. Well, anyway, uh, it got hotter and hotter and hotter every day as the sun slowly moved closer to the earth. Well, the people, they couldn't stand it, you know. They had their fans, air conditioning, you know uh, they, they, they took their clothes off, they were sweat, sweating. Oh, it was awful. And it was about how people and dogs, they were getting uh, so aggravated and people were going crazy from the heat, you know. And it was, uh, it, it showed you like what life would be like if this ever happened, if the sun ever went off of its uh, axis there and started hurling toward the earth. What would happen? Well, as it, again, the twist at the end. And you're going to hear a lot of spoilers in this episode uh, because I have to talk about the endings. But uh, if uh, so, what happened was it was all a dream. This lady was dreaming it. And when she woke up, it turned out that the in reality, in real life, the exact opposite was happening that the sun instead of hurling toward the earth, was moving away from the earth. And the earth was turning into this frigid, frozen tundra. And of course, uh, that's not good either. <laughs> so the earth was going to die. Uh, people, everything was going to die. And this lady in her dreams was dreaming about uh, how warm she was. So. Anyway, uh, so dreams had a lot to do with the episode. Uh, and we talked about the marathons. Yes, yes, I um, I love watching Twilight Zone Marathon. Although I, I do have I do have the, the box set of all of the episodes uh, together in one uh, one box set. It's really kind of cool. All right, I'll tell you what. I got to talk about it. Now let's let's talk about my favorite episodes of the Twilight Zone because there's a there's a good chance you're gonna hit 
for a lot of these too. Now I tried to pare it down to my top uh, 10, which is really hard to do because there were, uh, look at the exact figure here for you. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, there were 156 episodes of the Twilight Zone. So to, to pare it down to 10 was really tough, but I did the best I could. Okay, number one, these are, are not in any order of preference. These are just my top 10. Uh, what time enough to last? That's, you remember this one? Great. Burgess Meredith. That's the other thing about Todd Twilight Zone. It had so many celebrities in it. Uh, so many uh, up and coming celebrities in the late 50s, early 60s. Burgess Meredith was in this one. And of course, Burgess Meredith, as we know, uh, he was in quite a few Todd Twilight Zone episodes. And Burgess Meredith would go on to, uh, to uh, make Rocky, Mickey, and, and uh, the Penguin in Batman, the original Batman. He was just a great, great actor, good character, character actor. And that's the thing with Twilight Zone, that you had a, a young Robert Redford was in there. You had these guys, they looked so young, and it was like you hardly noticed them. Jack Klugman was in a few, William Shatner, of course. Famous William Shatner was in a, a few really, really cool, famous episodes, which we will talk about. So you had all these young actors just up and coming into their own. And uh, they all loved the Twilight Zone because the writing, the writing was so good. And most of the episodes were written by Rod Sermon, so, which we're going to talk about. All right, time enough to last. The premise of this, really quick, I'll give you a capsulized version of all these episodes, was uh, this guy, really, Burgess Meredith, loved to read. He never had enough time to read. His wife was always on him about reading, reading, reading books, books stacked up everywhere. He was even reading on the job. His job was a bank teller. Well, what he, what he did was on his lunch breaks, to get away from the crowd and to find some solitude to read, he, uh, went into the bank vault and he would close the bank vault for his uh, lunch, half an hour, to have his lunch and read. And it was nice quiet, right? Well, one day when he was doing this, there was a nuclear attack, a nuclear bomb. It destroyed the earth, destroyed all life on earth, except for Burgess Meredith, who was safe in the bank vault. When he came out of the bank vault, he saw everything around him was destroyed. Everything. And, and he got panicked. Of course, I would too. He's like, what am I going to do? Everybody is gone. I'm all alone. What am I going to do? He wanders through his little town. Everything's destroyed. He comes upon the library. And all the books, the building's destroyed, but all the books are And the books are all stacked up outside the window. And he's, he's happy. He says, I have time enough to last me. I can read and read and read and not worry about anything. Well, you know, he wore these really thick glasses to see. And what happened was, right at the end, the little twist was his glasses fell off his face, the lenses broke, and he wasn't able to read. So he had all this time, all these books, Nobody else in the world, but he didn't have classes to, to read. Ah, uh, uh, classic, classic stuff. Uh, another one. Oh, God. Well, The Last Flight. This was a cool one. It's about this World War II avian, a British, British guy, uh, flying around, goes into a cloud, a mysterious cloud, comes out, and he suddenly, in 1959, 19, from 1917 to 1959, there was like a time, time thing, time warp, this club. He lands at the local airport. They, they, they this, the, uh, the guys in charge, the military, military base, they're like, what the hell? Look at this plane. It's like, uh, 40 years old, you know? 
and so to make a long story short, he uh they can't believe he they they figure out he's uh he's a time trump. They can't believe it. They think he's lying. They think he's a spy or something. And he said no. He was uh chasing the the uh, Germans in the plane, Snoopy and the Red Baron, and uh, his other his buddy was in the other plane, and he lost sight of them. It was a it was an air fight, and he lost sight of his buddy, and that's when this guy entered the cloud and jumped from 1917 to 1915. Well, his buddy, it, as it turns out, was alive in 1959. Was became a general. He survived that uh, that airplane attack. He became a general, and uh, after this guy breaks out of the airport, gets into his airplane again, flies away to save his buddy. Uh, they find out that uh, this guy really, really was a time traveler, and I. It's just, it's just amazing. It's classic. It's classic. There's another one called The Stop at Willoughby, where this guy is a very, uh, a lot of anxiety and pressure stress. He works in New York City for an ad, ad, ad uh, he's an ad. And uh, stress, stress, stress. Come up with an ad. We need an ad for a cigarette to He lives in Connecticut. Takes the train home every day. Stressed from his wife, who wants him to make more money. She wants to move to a different house. Oh my God, stop it, stop, stop. The, the boss is on his neck. Stop, stop, it's all the stress. His only respite is when he takes the train at night and he can close his eyes and he can dream. And he starts dreaming for a few weeks, of this little tale called Willoughby. And it's it's like a Huckleberry Finn thing. And in his dream, he's, he's, he's looking out the train, and he sees how peaceful and tranquil it is out there in Willoughby. Kids with the straw hats, with the fishing cones, they, and the, uh, a, a band playing at the, in, the, in their local park, like our dogwood festival. You know, just a calm summer day, the seat outside of the train. And uh, this guy figures, okay, you know, I'm going, the next time I have that dream, I'm going to get off of this damn train and I'm going to go visit Willoughby. It looks so peaceful and calm. I need it. Willoughby. Well, again, to make a long story short, the conductor, next time he dreams, says, Willoughby, Willoughby, that stop is Willoughby. And goes like this to conductor. Yes, sir, it's Willoughby. Oh. The guy picks up, leaves his briefcase on the train seat, walks off the train. Next scene shows that his body is in the snow, off the train tracks. He jumped off the train. Apparently, a lot of people like uh, wonder what is this metaphor? Was that conductor really God? Was Willoughby really heaven? Right? Because once he got off the train for Willoughby, he could never go back again. And so in real life, he jumped off the train into the dark, killed himself. Well, the little twist at the end is. The funeral, the funeral guys who come and pick up his body, bag him up. They put him in the back of the hearse, close the door, and the name of the funeral directors are Willoughby and Sons. There you go. So, uh, so many great classes. The, the Howling Man. The Howling Man. With this guy who's like Moses in this castle in the, in the mountains somewhere, Bavaria or something. He has looked for Satan, the devil, for years and years. He finally catches Satan. Don't tell me how he does it. Annette, I don't know, brings him back to the castle, locks him up in a room, and uh, he hears a Satan howling. Oh, 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 to get out. 
this weary traveler comes in the rain, stops at the door, wants some respite from the rain. He's tired. The brothers all let him in. But then he goes to a short, he hears his howling, goes to the door. Satan says, oh, these crazy brothers have me locked up in here for 40 years. You got to let me out. Guy lets him out. It turns out to be the, the, the real devil, the Lucifer. He, he morphs into Satan. And uh, that's the way we know that uh, Brother Jerome, who is the leader of this cult-like thing, has to go catch something. Yeah, that's just, it's always something, isn't it? And you know what? Some of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes had to do with airplanes. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Because Rod certainly was, uh, he was into airplanes. Uh, Odyssey of Flight 33, where this uh, big Boeing jet, uh, many people, they they get, get caught into a, a time warp. You know, 20,000 feet, feet over the ocean. And uh, the sonic boom. And it takes the plane and its passengers back to the prehistoric era. And how they know is they look down where New York City is supposed to be, where they're supposed to land. No buildings, no people. There's jungle. And in the jungle, they see the Tyrosaurus Rex. Well, of course, they can't land there, so they pick up speed, they go back up to the cloud, and they hope to uh, get back to 1959. What happens is they get back, all right, they accelerate their speed, they find that that uh, wind thing, the jet thing, that uh, psh, takes some supersonic speed, right, break the tide barrier, psh, they get back to New York City, they don't get back far enough. They see the World's Fair down below. And it's not the World's Fair early in the 60s, it's the 1940 World's Fair. Can't land in 1940, New York. So they go back up, and that's where the uh, episode is. Will they ever get home? In fact, certainly, he just hops into these scenes before and after the show. He shows up at the back of the airplane and he says, and if you hear a wandering plane somewhere in the distance, send up an SOS, send up a flare, anything. Because it's probably flight 33. The came to go. <laughs> uh, 100 yards over the rim. Love this one. Settlers in a wagon train going west. What are the kids? has uh, malaria or something. Uh, he's ready to die. The father says, uh, I'm going to go for help. Mother says, but we're in the desert. What the hell? What? Where's help, help around here? He says, I don't know, but I need to go. He takes his rifle, goes 100 yards over the rim. Where the horizon is. On the other side of the hill, they go from 18... 76 or whatever to 1959. He sees big telephone transfer transformers there. He sees the road and cars going. He's like, where the hell am I? He stops into a local cafe where they actually give him some penicillin, which he puts in his pocket to take back. But they, they think he's crazy. They think he, they, they're going to lock him up. This guy is saying, you know, he's, he's, he's a settler with his wagon train going west. Make a long story short, he gets away, he goes over the rim, finds his wagon train, gives the pellet penicillin to the kid. Kid gets better, becomes a doctor when he gets older. They look him up in the history book, and that's he's, he's a doctor. Uh, final ones. Will the real Martians show up? These these people are stranded in a snowstorm in this little diner in the woods. Somewhere, I think it's a, outside of a lake in New York, maybe, upper New York. Maybe eight to ten people stranded in a, a, a bus stop at the diner to get some food. And they get stranded there because of the snowstorm. Well, uh, there's uh, uh, signs of... Uh, 
and a UFO has landed nearby and with footprints from in the snow right up to the dining. And uh, there's a scare about Mars, Mars being so close to Earth. And uh, they, they, they had seen these spacecraft uh, come down to Earth like uh, like comets, you know, but where did they land? What are they? Anyway, they, uh, they think that what are the people in the diner is actually in motion. Which one? And that's the episode. You go all through the episode, try to figure it out. It's like a puzzle. It's a mystery thing. Which person who got off the bus to get a meal at the diner? Which one is actually a Martian? The Martian blended in with the crowd. The bus driver said, well, I don't know if I remember you on the bus. Well, I don't know if I remember you. I do remember you. That's the really good thing you want. He remembers her. They try to find out who it is. Anyway, make a long story short, they leave. The uh, the Martian stays, uh, decides to get an extra cup of coffee, pays for the coffee, brings out a third arm and a third hand. The, uh, the guy behind the counter says, Ah, you're the Martian. He says, Yes, I'm the Martian, and I, we, I, we are this exploratory uh, group. Uh, set out to uh, view the Earth because our plans are to destroy the Earth, to uh, herd all its people together, take over the Earth. Well, the guy behind the counter says, you're a little too late. And the Martian says, why? He said, because we sent spacecraft from Venus above the Earth. And he takes off his hat his little chef's hat or whatever the hell you call it. And he has a third eyeball. He's from Venus. Anyway. Uh, so many good ones, you know. I, 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 I got more, but it's, uh, what the hell. Uh, so you see, you see what kind of episodes the Twilight Zone, the best, the best Twilight Zone uh, episodes were. Fantasy, sci-fi, some horror, but mostly sci-fi. Um, a, a blending, you know? Uh, a little boy talks to his dead grandmother on a toy telephone. Uh, a guy has a ventriloquist dummy that comes to life. Uh, just that, it's really, really odd things. But when you look at the stories, all right, before we go, I got to talk about my man, Rod Serling. Now, Rod Serling was the guy who produced and created Twilight Zone. Now, here's about Rod Serling. He was this young guy for Christmas Day, actually, 1924. Died. He was only 50 years old. Died. June 28, 1975. He was the main writer and producer of Twilight Zone. He grew up in Birmingham, New York. In the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, he was described in Hollywood as an angry young man. And the reason they gave him this title was because he was always uh, in a battle with the CBS censors. Uh, he, he, Rod Serling was a brilliant film. God, that's number one. But he was also ahead of his time as far as fighting racism. It, think about it. When we talk about the late 50s and early 60s, when the Twilight Zone was on the air, it, uh, you know, uh, it was at the time of racial upheaval. It, it was just a bad, bad time, you know, as far as civil rights are concerned. Rod Serling, not only before, he thought of the during the reign of the Twilight Zone, but that's a power. So the king is able to. Uh, white episodes about uh, how much racism sucked. So, yeah. But he didn't afford it. He was a, a very much a champion of the uh, of, uh, I don't know, just wanted to uh, listen. Yeah. Well, anyway, when, when he was in school at Berlin, he was considered a class plan 
that be a good thing while I'm at free school. These teachers thought, oh, you know what? He's not going to walk from me. He doesn't pay attention. He wasn't, he wasn't focused. Um, but what turned his life around for him was we got him at free school. One teacher, and you think it's always the way, you always have one favorite teacher when you're in school, and that teacher really makes a difference in our lives. This teacher got Rod Sermon to join the debate team. And as he said, you know what? Underneath all this clown, class clown stuff, is, I think he's, he's got a brilliant mind. He's brilliant. He's a great writer. He got Sermon into writing for the school newspaper. And that's what kind of turned his world around. He really got into the brain. He was a hell of an athlete, too. Uh, he was on tennis team. He was only a little guy. He was only like five four, but he was into. He wanted to play football. He was too small. He was into table tennis and tennis. And what he really did was he really got into radio. You know, because the school had a a, a school radio station. He got into that, so he started uh, writing the commercials and, and the, some of the shows and everything. And he really liked it. And then later on, you know, he got into his college radio station as a as a, an announcer, as a writer, as a producer. And later on in life, Serling said, you know, that really, really made a difference. It kind of made me who I am today. Because in radio, you have to be what they call a very precise, be a second writer. In other words, you may have a the commercial or, or a little skit or something that is only 30 seconds long, and you have to write it exactly 30 seconds. So Serling got a good sense of what it takes or what it took to write precisely like that. And when he got into TV writing, he did scripts for the Twilight Zone, uh, that really paid off because he was able to tell a whole story in whatever time we gave him, 22 minutes, 24 minutes per episode. Uh, when Surly, uh, after he graduated from high school in, in Upper New York, he uh, immediately, the day after graduation, he enlisted into the Army because it was World War II. World War II was just starting up, so um, he enlisted in 1942. And uh, he got into a uh, parachute, parachute troop uh, brigade. And uh, while he was in the, uh, in the service, he became a boxer. Can you imagine Rod Serling as a boxer? He actually fought 17 fights as an amateur. First fight he had, he broke his nose. Last fight he had is he broke his nose. He said, nah, yeah, you got to be a better weight. But that's not right. When he was in the uh, in the service, World War II, very, very decorated. Rod Serling was a hero. Not only did he do the paratrooper stuff, but then when they sent him to the Pacific to fight the Japanese, he was a little disappointed because he actually wanted to fight Hitler. But you go where they send you, right? So he was in the Pacific Theater and he got into this is Star Serling's life. He was such a daredevil. It's so courageous. He got into the Demolition Brigade. They were known as the Death Squad. Why? Because not many people survived Demolition. He was the guy who would go out and plant the bombs, and he was the guy who would detonate and defuse the bombs and hand grenades and things like that. Um, in his regiment in the Pacific, 400 soldiers were killed or wounded, 400, while he was in there. He was just a very lucky guy, or just a very 
courageous guy. Uh, Rod Serling earned the Purple Heart, the Broad Star, and something called the Philippine Liberation Medal. You know, they parachuted Serling and his troop into the Philippines. General MacArthur took over the Philippines. Then Serling went to Japan as the U.S. was winding down the war and uh, spent some time in Japan, too. Uh, and, and after that, Serling said later on, uh, he saw people die every day. Some of his closest friends would die. Uh, and that, he, he had nightmares and flashbacks for the rest of his life. And he thought seeing death and suffering every day was sort of a precursor to the twilight zone. I mean, not only did it make him appreciate life more, but uh, it was just uh, seeing all this every single day in the war and knowing that he was a lucky one and he survived. Uh, he was a daredevil, though, because after he, uh, right before he left the service, he was discharged. Um, uh, he volunteered, well, not volunteered, he got paid thousand dollars, which was a lot of money back in those days, you know, back in the 40s. Um, uh, jet, uh, injections, nobody else would do it because people died. Uh, he said, I'll do it. They were experimenting with these injections out of the out of the uh, jets. He he volunteered for all that shit, you know. It's like the guy he wasn't afraid to die. He didn't care, you know. It's like extraordinary. Anyway, to wrap it up, Twilight Zone. Uh, uh, then, like I said, Serling went into radio. Eventually, got Serling came into uh, TV and radio at the perfect time. Because radio was out of Tate uh, television was in its infancy in the early 50s. And certainly uh, got into both, had all that experience from being uh, in past radio stations, uh, was a brilliant, brilliant writer, set scripts around, was rejected many, many times. So you, you guys out there who may be writers, I know the feeling. You're rejected. Rejections don't give up hope. A brilliant writer like Rod Serling was rejected time and time and time again. You just have to have the luck to find your your script, your novel, whatever, will eventually find a home. You just got to keep trying. And that's what Serling did. Until he eventually, CBS loved his work because he actually wrote Requiem, 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 I can't say the word. Of a heavyweight, not a boxer. Yeah, uh, Serling's all uh, boxing. He had a lot of boxing stories. He wrote that movie, brilliant movie, and that convinced CBS, CBS to uh, give him his own show called The Twilight Zone. Uh, 156 episodes, 92, 92 episodes <clears throat> were written by Rod Serling. Almost every every episode. In the first two seasons were written by Sony. That's all he did for those two years was write, write, write. Uh, at night, weekends, he just constantly churned out the scripts, setting them out, setting, uh, constantly, constantly. Uh, he worked really, really hard as a writer. Uh, what happened to Sony? Well, uh, after the Twilight Zone was canceled in the mid '60s, uh, came up with another show called Night Gallery, which was sort of like the Twilight Zone, only okay? different, different, and had the same sort of uh, macabre. Or I would say the Night Gallery was more horror than uh, science fiction, and uh, Serling hosted that, and he wrote a lot of those scripts. Well, you know, Rod Serling smoked three to four packs of cigarettes a day for many, many years. 
course, we know what you, we know how bad smoking is now. But back in the day, back in the 50s, 60s, even early 70s, look how look how much they publicized smoking in the movies on TV. Everybody had a cigarette. They thought it was cool, right? Um, it eventually caught up to serving. He had several heart attacks. In fact, after his second heart attack, his doctor said, you're not going to live uh, much longer. Uh, we have to do open heart surgery. We have to in order to save your life. Now, there is a risk. Of course, there is a risk. But you're not going to be able to survive the way you So, so he said, okay, let's do the open heart surgery. 1975. Uh, on 10-hour op operation, on the operating table, Surly has another heart attack. Dies right on the table. Dies right on the table. Uh, just a brilliant guy. It's a shame. Cigarettes. Uh, final point. TV Guide in 2013 made a list of the 25 greatest science fiction legends of all time. And that could be uh, uh, fact or fiction. You know, we're talking about uh, science fiction, right? Could be uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Spock, Mr. Spock from Star Trek, uh, Luke Skywalker from Star Wars, right? Obi Wan Kenobi, um, the robot from Lost in Space. Yeah, <laughs> legends, twenty-five of them. Most of them were characters, not real people. Rod Serling was the one of the few real people on that list. And out of all those great legends in sci-fi, Rod Serling, the man, ended up number one on the list of the greatest legends in sci-fi history in toy television. I wish I would have met the guy. I would have been fascinated to have dinner with him, to sit down with him and talk to him about writing. How does one write a script? How he gets got all those ideas for all those great Twilight Zone shows. Uh, it's just about his life, you know, being in World War II. Just fascinating guy. Uh, sorry, I didn't get a chance to meet him. His daughter, he had two daughters, one of his daughters, is on Twitter, and she actually uh, responded to uh, one of my tweets one time. That's kind of cool. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to our classic TV episode of The Twilight Zone. Do yourself a favor. Find it. If you've never seen it, or you haven't seen it in a while, or maybe you're a fan of The Twilight Zone, and you just, after this, you, you get the bug and say, I got to see these episodes again. They brilliant. Find it, whether it be on the Sci Fi channel or wherever, and enjoy it, okay? And get ready. Next week for Memorial Day, uh, there may be a uh, Twilight Zone marathon on it somewhere around you. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Enjoy the weekend. I can't believe next weekend is Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. Todd flies, eh? When you're having fun. Go Phillies tonight. They won again last night. Nothing stopping them. Go Phillies. And I'll talk to you guys again soon. Probably Monday or Tuesday. So, take care. Peace and love, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to the show. See you later. Bye-bye.